The starship Astrid Dawn roared through Athra's crimson sky, its metal frame groaning under the strain of gravity tearing it apart. The ship spun uncontrollably, the view outside the viewport a dizzying blur of toxic clouds and crackling blue lightning. Jace Harrow clenched his jaw, his hands slick with sweat as he struggled to secure the last of the medical supplies. Jace, we're coming in too fast. Captain Myra's voice crackled through the comms, strained and urgent. The normally unflappable commander was wrestling with controls in the bridge, but Jace couldn't spare a glance. He had his own battle to fight. Strap in and brace yourselves, everyone. Myra's voice echoed again, and the warning lights flared crimson, casting a hellish glow over the medical bay. Jace slammed the final case of antibiotics into a secure locker and staggered to his seat. The Astrid Dawn hit an air pocket, and gravity lost its grip, sending him weightless for a fraction of a second before the ship bucked again. He crashed into the seat with a grunt, snapping the safety harness across his chest just in time. The ship's AI, a calm and far too cheerful voice named Virus, chimed in, impact in 15 seconds. Best of luck, Dr. Harrow. Statistically, your survival odds are... Not now, Virus. Jace snapped, his knuckles white as he gripped the edges of his seat. He could feel every muscle in his body tighten, bracing for the inevitable collision. The world beyond the viewport had dissolved into a whirl of glowing, phosphorescent swamps and jagged terrain. And then, with a force that seemed to split the universe in two, the ship crashed. The impact was a violent symphony of metal screeching and the earth splitting, a cacophony that stole the breath from Jace's lungs. He was thrown forward, his safety harness biting into his chest, leaving him gasping as the ship skidded across the swamp, carving deep, muddy trenches. When the noise finally ebbed into an eerie, smothering quiet, Jace sat motionless, his ears ringing. The world felt unreal, the way it does when the mind refuses to process what the body has endured. He sucked in a breath, the coppery taste of adrenaline coating his tongue. Slowly, painfully, he unbuckled himself, ignoring the way his hands trembled. Around him, the medical bay was a disaster zone, supplies scattered, cabinets hanging by a single bolt, and the sickly blue emergency lights casting shadows that seemed almost alive. He checked himself over. Bruised ribs, a gash above his eyebrow bleeding sluggishly, but nothing life-threatening. Status check, he muttered, stumbling toward the intercom. His voice came out rough, scraping the inside of his throat like sandpaper. Myra's voice responded, Horse but alive. Bridge intact. Minor injuries. We... We're not in good shape, doctor. How's medical? Jace looked around at the ruined bay and exhaled shakily. Barely standing, but functional. We're lucky to be breathing. Myra's sigh of relief was audible. Get to the crew deck and assess the wounded. We're grounded in hostile territory, Jace. Time is not our friend. Copy that, he said, before letting the intercom crackle into silence. Jace grabbed what he could from the wreckage, a portable med kit, oxygen patches, and a tranquilizer gun loaded with neurotoxins, because if Ather was half as dangerous as the landing brief had suggested, he'd be grateful for the extra defense. He staggered into the corridor, moving past flickering panels and hissing steam vents, his heart heavy. The air in the ship had an acrid, chemical tang, and Jace knew that even if the hull had held, they wouldn't be safe for long. The neurotoxic spores in Athra's atmosphere could seep through the tiniest fissures, and once they did, they'd be playing a dangerous game of survival. The first crew member he reached was Alex, an engineer pinned beneath a collapsed beam. Her eyes flickered open, unfocused but stubbornly holding on. Jace dropped to one knee beside her, his voice gentle but urgent. Hey, Alex. Stay with me, all right? You look like hell. Alex managed a ghost of a smile, her lips cracking. Could say, the same for you, document. Jace didn't waste time. He worked quickly, applying a local anesthetic to numb the pain and pressing a brace against her fractured leg. His movements were methodical, but inside, his thoughts were a whirlwind of calculations and dread. Every second counted. Every mistake was a potential death sentence. Virus's voice chimed in again, dispassionate and clinical. Doctor, external sensors indicate atmospheric contamination levels rising. Immediate containment advised. Tell me something I don't know, Jace growled, pushing himself to his feet. He activated the portable air filters, 
knowing they'd only buy them a short window of safety. The Astrid Dawn had become a tomb, half buried in a luminous swamp that pulsed and glowed with an otherworldly beauty. Jace glanced through a shattered viewport, and his stomach twisted. The swamp was alive with phosphorescent plants and insect-like creatures, their bodies illuminated with a sickly blue-green light. Each movement, each rustle of alien flora, seemed almost sentient, watching, waiting. The ground trembled, sending ripples through the swamp water. Jace steadied himself, his heart pounding. Just as he was about to move to the next section of the ship, a sound cut through the quiet, a rustling unnatural and too purposeful. It came from outside. He stilled, every instinct sharpening. The swamp's bioluminescent foliage parted, and figures emerged, their bodies painted in muddy ochre and olive green. Jace had seen many strange things in his career as a xenobiologist, but nothing quite like this. They were humanoid, but their movements were almost predatory, silent, and fluid. Their eyes, luminous and feral, tracked his every move. At the forefront was a woman, taller than the rest, her presence commanding. Her skin glistened in the swamp's glow, a canvas of olive tones and carefully applied ochre patterns. Her gaze held his with an intensity that made his breath hitch. Before Jace could speak, the woman, a warrior, he realized, from the way she held her spear, raised a hand. Her voice rang out, a low, melodic command in a language he didn't understand. The other figures closed in, surrounding the wrecked Astrid Dawn. Jace tightened his grip on the tranquilizer gun, though he knew it was a fool's defense against this many opponents. His voice, when he spoke, was calm, the kind of forced calm he'd mastered after years of staring death in the face. I come in peace, he said, knowing full well how cliché it sounded. He forced a lopsided grin. You wouldn't happen to have a universal translator, would you? The warrior woman tilted her head, her expression inscrutable. Her eyes flickered to the ruined ship, the injured crew members, and finally back to him. When she spoke again, it was in broken, but understandable, galactic standard. Human. Trespassers. What price will you pay? Jace swallowed, the humor draining from his expression. We're not here by choice, he said, his voice steady despite the terror creeping in. Our ship crashed. My people are dying, poisoned by this planet's air. I need... I need time to find a cure. The woman stepped closer, and Jace's pulse thundered in his ears. Her gaze softened, just for a moment, and he wondered if she could sense the desperation in his voice. But the softness vanished as quickly as it had come, replaced by a warrior's resolve. You ask? For mercy, she said, her voice as beautiful and dangerous as the swamp itself. Her spear lowered, the tip hovering inches from his chest. Yet this world is not forgiving. The world seemed to hold its breath, and for a moment, Jace could feel the weight of the planet itself pressing down on him. His mind raced, cataloging every fact he knew about Athra, about survival, about negotiation. Then, he did the one thing he could think of. He let the gun fall from his grip and raised his hands. Vulnerability wasn't something he embraced easily, but he understood when to play his cards right. If you help us, he said quietly, I swear I'll find a way to fix this. I'm a healer. Let me do my job. The woman studied him, her expression unreadable. Finally, she stepped back and lowered her spear. A flicker of something, perhaps curiosity, perhaps pity, crossed her face. You will come, she said. Our fate is intertwined now. And just like that, the course of their survival changed. The journey to the alien camp was a strange, almost dreamlike ordeal. Jace stumbled over slick roots and sank knee-deep into the swamp sludge as he tried to keep pace with the tribe that had taken him prisoner, or perhaps under their temporary protection, depending on how optimistic he felt. The swamp's luminescent plants pulsed with an eerie rhythm, casting shadows that seemed to stretch and writhe in the misty air. Olynthia, the warrior woman who had confronted him, led the way. Her movements were deliberate and silent, each step a dance of balance and grace. Jace couldn't help but notice the intricate designs painted on her skin, swirls and runes of muddy ochre that seemed almost alive under the swamp's glow. Even in the dim light, she was breathtakingly formidable. Jace's mind raced, trying to piece together what he knew of Athra's native cultures. The planet had been shrouded in mystery, 
its tribes isolated and fiercely territorial. Most explorers who dared to venture into its depths never returned, or if they did, they spoke in whispers of a world that resisted all attempts at domination. Virus's voice broke his concentration, echoing from his wrist communicator. The AI had survived the crash, though its humor remained as dark as ever. Dr. Harrow, based on your current predicament, would you like me to calculate the probability of your survival? It's only mildly depressing. Jace fought back a groan, glancing around to make sure none of the aliens had overheard. He murmured under his breath, Shut it, virus. Unless you can charm these people, you're not helping. The AI paused, as if contemplating sarcasm, but before it could respond, Olynthia halted. The entire party came to an abrupt stop, and Jace had to dig his heels into the muddy ground to avoid colliding with the warrior in front of him. Olynthia turned, her eyes narrowing as she fixed him with a penetrating stare. Human, she said, her voice a mix of caution and command. Speak not to your spirit machine. She gestured to his communicator, clearly suspicious. Our lands here, our thoughts. Your words may awaken. Unwanted echoes. Jace opened his mouth to protest, then thought better of it. He switched off virus, feeling the unsettling weight of silence. Right, he said, nodding carefully. No spirit machine talk. Got it. Olynthia tilted her head, her gaze still heavy with mistrust. But something else lingered there, a spark of curiosity she was perhaps unwilling to admit. With a flick of her hand, she gestured for the group to move forward again. The tribe's camp emerged from the swamp like a dream half-formed from light and shadow. Giant crystal structures sprouted from the ground, humming softly as if tuned to some planetary frequency Jace couldn't hear. The air was thick with the scent of unfamiliar herbs and the tang of something metallic. Shimmering vines draped over the settlement, and bioluminescent moths flitted between them, casting fragmented patterns on the ground. Everywhere Jace looked, there were signs of both advanced understanding and deep-rooted tradition. Machines made of carved crystal and living plants pulsed with energy, blending technology and nature in ways that defied his comprehension. But there was also a raw, undeniable vitality. Children running barefoot across the glowing moss, warriors sharpening obsidian-tipped spears, healers tending to the sick with a mix of chants and herbal compresses. The sheer beauty and danger of it all left Jace momentarily stunned. He was pulled from his reverie by a rough shove from behind. One of the warriors, a burly man with ochre markings shaped like jagged lightning bolts, growled something that needed no translation. Move. Olynthia led him to the center of the camp, where a massive crystalline totem loomed over a gathering of elders. The totem thrummed with energy, its surface shifting between hues of deep indigo and electric green. Jace couldn't help but feel a sense of awe, though it was mixed with the gnawing anxiety of a man out of his element. The elders turned as one. They were regal, painted with the most elaborate designs Jace had seen yet, and each carried an air of authority that demanded respect. At the head of the circle was a woman with silver hair threaded with moss and vines, her eyes as sharp and luminous as Olynthia's. She stepped forward, her expression a blend of weariness and wisdom. Olynthia knelt before the elders, her posture one of deep reverence. Her voice, when she spoke, was clear and melodic. Great Mother the Laura, this human and his metal bird fell from the sky. He claims he can cure the sickness that creeps through our lands. Jace swallowed hard, knowing that every eye in the camp was on him. He tried to ignore the weight of their stares, focusing instead on the elder, the Laura. She stepped closer, her gaze piercing through the distance between them. You come here, human, with promises, the Laura said, her voice even but laced with skepticism. Our people have lost too much already. The land withers, the air bites, and our blood turns against us. How can one who falls from the sky claim to hold the power to heal? Jace took a steadying breath, his mind racing. The only way to earn their trust was to speak with honesty and desperation. Great Mother, he began, his voice strong but humble, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I'm a healer. My crew, my people, are dying from the same poison that threatens your tribe. If we don't work together, we'll all be consumed. The camp fell silent, the only sound the hum of the crystal totem. Dolores' eyes narrowed slightly, as though she was weighing every word he spoke. But before she could respond, a new voice cut through the air. Lies. 
The cry came from a tall warrior standing at the edge of the gathering. He was imposing, with ochre markings that spiraled around his muscular arms like serpents. His eyes were dark, burning with mistrust. This outsider is a bringer of doom. We should end him now, before his presence curses us further. Olynthia shot to her feet, her expression darkening. Velos, hold your tongue. The great mother has not spoken. But Velos ignored her, stepping forward, his hand resting on the hilt of his bone-bladed dagger. You bring this creature into our sacred lands, Olynthia? Have you forgotten the price of your foolish curiosity? Jace's pulse quickened. It didn't take a genius to figure out that Velos held a grudge, and that it had more to do with Olynthia than with him. He kept his face neutral, though every instinct screamed for him to back away. The Laura raised a hand, silencing the murmurs that had broken out among the tribe. Her eyes, fierce and knowing, met Velos's. Enough. We are not savages, Velos. The human will be given a chance to prove his worth. Velos's jaw clenched, but he stepped back, his glare never leaving Jace. The tension was a living thing, heavy and crackling, but the Laura's authority seemed to hold it at bay. She turned back to Jace, her gaze softer but still guarded. Human healer, she said, you will be given one day and one night to prove your intentions. If you fail, our mercy will end. Jace inclined his head, knowing better than to argue. Thank you, he replied, his voice steady even though his heart was pounding. I won't waste this chance. Olynthia exhaled, the tightness in her shoulders easing slightly. She stepped closer to Jace, her voice low enough that only he could hear. You're braver than you look, human, she said, and there was something almost like reluctant admiration in her eyes. But bravery alone won't save you here. Jace managed a wry smile, though it felt fragile on his lips. Good thing I've got a few other tricks up my sleeve, then. Olynthia's expression remained unreadable, but a flicker of something warm, perhaps hope, perhaps doubt, passed over her face. She turned away, leading him deeper into the camp, and Jace followed, feeling the weight of an entire world pressing on his shoulders. He had one day and one night, and somehow, he had to make it count. Jace awoke to the sound of low, rhythmic chanting drifting through the humid air. The alien sun had barely crested the horizon, painting the swamp in hues of crimson and molten gold. Tendrils of mist curled around the crystalline totems scattered across the camp, making the whole place feel like a surreal painting brought to life. He rubbed the sleep from his eyes and tried to shake off the ache in his muscles from the restless night. The anxiety hadn't let him rest much, knowing that his every breath here on Athra could be his last if he failed to find a cure. His crew's lives, and possibly his own, depended on him. Olynthia approached, her footfalls impossibly light despite the thick mud. Her olive-green skin shimmered in the morning light, the muddy ochre paint on her body forming ancient patterns that seemed to shift and breathe with her. Jace had spent part of the previous day trying to understand how someone could exude both fierceness and grace, but he had given up. Olynthia was a puzzle he wasn't sure he had the pieces to solve. She eyed him with guarded curiosity. Human, she said, her voice tinged with both formality and a hint of something warmer. Are you prepared? Jace swallowed and forced himself to stand straighter, despite the ache. Prepared as I'll ever be. He tapped the bag slung across his back, filled with vials, rudimentary medical tools salvaged from the crash, and his portable bioscanner. Where are we going? Olynthia gestured toward the horizon, where the crimson sky bled into the crystalline desert. The singing dunes, she replied, her tone solemn. The cure you seek lies within the heart of Athra's song. Jace frowned. Singing dunes. Her eyes met his, a ghost of a smile touching her lips. You will understand soon enough. The tribe had prepared supplies for their journey, a woven satchel of dried herbs and spore-resistant poultices, and a flask filled with water infused with some bioluminescent plant extract. Jace had no idea if it would keep him safe, but he took it gratefully. As they left the camp, Jace couldn't help but notice Velos watching them from a distance, his dark eyes glinting with barely concealed distrust. The warrior's fingers curled around the hilt of his dagger, and Jace had no doubt that if he faltered in his mission, Velos would be the first to strike. There was history there, between Velos and Olynthia, but now wasn't the time to dwell on it. They trekked through the swamp, moving from glowing blue pools to dark stretches of mud that sucked at Jace's boots. The air buzzed with energy, 
and the plants seemed to shiver and hum as they passed, as though Athra itself was alive and listening. The weight of the planet's toxicity pressed on Jace's lungs, and he was grateful for the herbal-infused Mascolinthia had given him. He tried to break the silence, if only to distract himself from the alien world closing in around him. So, how does this Athra's song thing work? he asked, dodging a luminous vine that reached toward him like a grasping hand. Olinthia glanced at him, her ochre-painted face serious. The singing dunes resonate with the lifeblood of our planet. The crystal flowers that bloom there hold properties that can heal or destroy, depending on the balance of energies. The wrong resonance could end us both. Jace frowned, trying to process that. He had always prided himself on understanding the biochemical and physical sciences of alien worlds, but Athra defied simple explanation. Balance of energies, he muttered, more to himself. I'm a doctor, not a mystic. Olinthia tilted her head, the hint of a smile returning. Your science and our mysticism are not so different, Jace Harrow. This world demands that both be understood. They pressed on until the swamp began to thin, replaced by sands the color of polished brass. The ground vibrated under their feet, as though alive with a rhythm Jace couldn't quite hear. The dunes stretched out before them, humming with a song that was felt more than heard, a low vibration that made his chest tighten. This is unsettling, Jace murmured, gripping his bio-scanner tighter. The device flickered erratically, unable to stabilize a reading. Olinthia knelt in the sand and touched the ground with reverence. The dunes do not welcome intruders, she said, her voice almost lost in the wind. We must tread carefully. Jace exhaled, every muscle in his body on high alert. The desert was far from empty. Shadows moved across the horizon, and the air shimmered with heat and strange, bending light. He followed Olinthia as she led them toward a cluster of crystals sprouting from the sand, each one pulsing with an inner light that seemed to match the rhythm of the dunes. He activated his bio-scanner again, praying for some usable data. All right, he said, mostly to himself, show me what you've got. But just as he began to record data, the ground beneath them shifted violently. The sand trembled, and Jay stumbled, barely keeping his footing. Olinthia shot him a sharp look, her body tense. We must not disrupt the song, she warned, her eyes scanning the horizon. Jace didn't get a chance to respond. A shrill high-pitched wail cut through the air, sending a jolt of fear through his veins. The sound came from a massive insectoid creature emerging from the dunes, its chitinous body gleaming in the sun. Its head was crowned with jagged crystal-like protrusions, and its many eyes glowed with a hostile, alien intelligence. A krellhound, Olinthia hissed, her voice tight. She drew her spear, the tip shimmering with some kind of toxin-laced resin. Stay close. Jace's mouth went dry. He had no weapons except the tranquilizer gun strapped to his belt, and even that felt like a child's toy against this behemoth. The Krellhound let out another wail, its sound waves vibrating the air around them, making Jace's teeth ache. Olinthia didn't hesitate. She darted forward, her movements a blur of practiced efficiency, her spear slicing through the air. The Krellhound lunged at her, its crystal-tipped mandibles snapping shut where she had just been. Jace's heart pounded in his ears as he fumbled for his gun, aiming at the creature's exposed joints. Jace. Olinthia called, her voice commanding. Its weakness lies in the gaps between the crystals. Aim true. He didn't have time to question her. Jace steadied his shaking hands and fired a tranquilizer dart at the creature's knee joint. The dart embedded itself, and the Krellhound let out a screech of pain, its massive body buckling for a moment. Olinthia took the opportunity, driving her spear into the creature's side with a battle cry that echoed across the dunes. The Krellhound writhed, its crystalline protrusions flashing in the sunlight, and then it collapsed, its body shattering like glass. Jace stood frozen for a moment, the gun still clutched in his trembling hands. Olinthia straightened, her breathing labored but her eyes fierce. You did well, she said, wiping sweat from her brow. Jace let out a shaky laugh, adrenaline still coursing through him. I think I need a new definition of well, he muttered, his voice tight with nerves. He glanced at the shards of the defeated creature, glistening like cursed diamonds in the sand. Please tell me that's the only one of those things around. Olinthia's gaze darkened. The dunes are restless today. We must be swift. 
They continued deeper into the desert, the rhythmic hum of the sand growing louder, almost oppressive. Finally, they reached a cluster of crystal flowers, each one glowing with an ethereal blue light. Jace knelt beside them, his bioscanner buzzing with data that made no sense. These flowers, he murmured, they have properties I've never seen before. But the resonance, he trailed off, looking up at Olynthia. How do I balance it? How do I harness this without triggering a reaction that could kill us both? Olynthia's expression softened, and for a moment, he saw something vulnerable in her eyes. You must feel the song, she whispered, placing her hand on his chest. Feel Athera's pulse. It is not something I can teach. Jace stared at her, the weight of his inexperience pressing down on him. But as he looked into her eyes, he realized that this wasn't just a test of science. It was a test of trust. He closed his eyes, focused on the rhythm of the planet, and let himself feel, really feel, the life force that pulsed around him. And slowly, impossibly, he began to understand. Jace knelt in the golden sands of the singing dunes, the crystal flowers shimmering like trapped starlight around him. His heart beat in time with the pulse of Athra, and for the first time, he felt a tentative connection to the planet's living, breathing rhythm. The weight of Olynthia's hand on his chest was grounding, her touch warm and steady despite the oppressive heat of the desert. He took a breath, deeper and more purposeful than any he had taken since the Astrid Dawn crash-landed. He reached out with his hands, feeling the energy resonating in the flowers, the hum vibrating through his very bones. His fingers brushed the petals, and the flowers flared with a sudden burst of blue light. For a terrifying moment, the ground trembled, and Jace feared he had done something catastrophic. But then, as if soothed by his presence, the resonance evened out, settling into a gentle hum. Jace let out the breath he'd been holding and collected a sample of the glowing petals, carefully sealing them in one of his vials. Relief swept through him, so palpable he almost sagged in the sand. They had found it, the cure. He turned to Olynthia, a triumphant grin spreading across his face. We did it, he said, the words tasting sweeter than victory. This will work. I can synthesize an antidote for both my crew and your people. Olynthia's expression, so often guarded, softened with a mixture of relief and something that looked like pride. You listened, she murmured, her voice laced with admiration. Perhaps there is more to you than stubbornness and science, Jace Harrow. Jace's smile faltered at the depth of her gaze, and for a fleeting moment, he wondered if something deeper was blossoming between them, something fragile and unspoken. But the moment was cut short by the sound of sand shifting, footsteps approaching. Jace turned just in time to see Velos emerge from behind a dune, his spear glinting menacingly in the harsh sunlight. His ochre-painted face was twisted in a scowl, and his dark eyes burned with betrayal. You fool, Velos spat, his voice echoing through the dunes. You dare defile our sacred sands? You bring this outsider here, Olynthia. He stepped forward, his hands tightening around the shaft of his weapon. You have doomed us all. Olynthia's posture straightened, and she placed herself between Jace and Velos, her chin raised in defiance. Velos enough, she commanded, though her voice trembled ever so slightly. The human has found the cure. He is trying to save us, both our people and his own. But Velos's expression hardened, his mistrust and jealousy palpable. A cure? Do not be blinded by his lies. He and his people are plague-bearers, invaders who bring poison to our lands and disrupt the balance of Athra. His eyes narrowed, and he pointed his spear at Jace, the tip inches from his throat. You will pay for your transgressions, human. Jace's pulse raced, and he struggled to remain calm, though his hands itched to reach for the tranquilizer gun at his side. I don't want trouble, he said, his voice low and measured. We're on the same side here, Velos. If we don't work together, the sickness will destroy us all. But Velos's grip only tightened, and for a breathless moment, Jace was certain the warrior would strike. The tension crackled in the air like a lightning storm, a brittle, fragile thing. Olynthia stepped forward, her voice as sharp as a blade. Velos, stand down. The Great Mother herself decreed that the human should be given a chance. Velos's eyes flickered with rage and grief, his emotions laid bare. You defend him, he whispered, his voice cracking. You risk everything, for him. His gaze locked onto Olynthia, 
and Jace saw the pain there, the anguish of someone whose love had turned to bitterness. It clicked into place then, the reason for Veloz's hostility. It wasn't just about protecting the tribe, it was personal. Jace swallowed the realization, knowing he was walking a razor's edge. Before any of them could speak, the ground beneath their feet trembled again. But this time, it was not the rhythm of the dunes. It was something far more menacing. A deep rumble reverberated through the sand, and the crystals surrounding them flared with blinding light. Olynthia's eyes widened in horror. The balance is broken, she breathed, her voice filled with dread. Jace's stomach lurched as he felt the air shift, a crackling tension that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. The anomaly that had dragged the Astrid Dawn to Athra was no mere natural phenomenon. It was a weapon, a remnant of an ancient conflict buried deep within the planet. And now, their actions had awakened it. A chasm split open in the sand, jagged and seething with a swirling energy that made Jace's skin prickle. From the rift, a wave of pure, raw power surged outward, distorting the air. The singing dunes were no longer just humming, they screamed, a mournful, gut-wrenching wail. Jace stumbled backward, clutching the vial of crystal petals to his chest. What the hell is that? he shouted, his voice cracking as the ground buckled beneath him. Olynthia's expression was grim, fear tightening her features. An ancient curse, she said, barely audible over the rising chaos. The harbinger of silence, a weapon left by those who tried to conquer Athra long ago. It will consume everything if we do not stop it. Veloz's bravado faltered, and he took a shaky step back, his confidence crumbling in the face of the apocalyptic energy swirling around them. But he was still a warrior, and he tried to mask his fear with anger. You see, he spat, this is the human's doing. He has brought ruin upon us. Jace's patience snapped, and he turned on Velos, his voice seething with frustration. Blame me all you want later, but right now, we have bigger problems. He looked to Olynthia, desperation in his eyes. Tell me there's a way to stop this. Olynthia's face was pale, but she set her jaw with fierce determination. The harbinger must be calmed, its energy redirected. We need the resonance of the crystal flowers and a conduit to ground the power. She met Jace's gaze, and he saw the weight of the responsibility she placed on him. Me, Jace realized, his throat tight. You need me to do it. Olynthia stepped closer, her hand brushing his, her touch grounding him. You are attuned to Athra now your science and our song together. They may be enough. Velo scoffed, his eyes darting between them. This is madness. But Jace was already moving, his heart pounding as he grabbed the crystal petals and the rudimentary equipment he had brought. He had no idea if it would work, but he had to try. There was no other option. He planted his feet in the shifting sands and steadied his hands, his mind racing through everything he had learned. The resonance, the balance, the pulse of the planet. He had to channel it, had to trust that his understanding of biochemistry and Olynthia's mystic teachings could merge into something that made sense. Olynthia took her place beside him, her spear in hand, ready to defend against whatever force might emerge from the rift. She glanced at Jace, her expression fierce and resolute. Do not falter, she said, her voice a thread of steel. Jace closed his eyes, feeling the resonance thrum through him. He let the rhythm of Athera guide him, let it flood his senses until he was no longer just a man of science but a conduit for something far greater. The energy of the planet crackled around him, and he channeled it through the crystal petals, praying that the balance would hold. The ground quaked, and for a terrible moment, he thought he had failed. The energy roared, the air splitting with the force of it, and then, the light fractured, cascading around them in shimmering waves. The rift slowly began to close the harbinger's power dissipating like a storm retreating into the horizon. The singing dunes settled into a low, mournful hum, and the world grew still once more. Jace collapsed to his knees, every muscle trembling with exhaustion. The vial of crystal petals fell from his grasp, and he sucked in deep, ragged breaths. Olynthia knelt beside him, her eyes wide with a mixture of relief and awe. She didn't say anything, just placed a hand on his shoulder, her touch gentle and grounding. Velos stood a few paces away, his spear hanging limply at his side. The anger had bled from his face, replaced by something raw and uncertain. He didn't apologize, 
but the hatred in his gaze had dimmed. Jace met Olynthia's eyes, a thousand unspoken words passing between them. They had done it, together. But the weight of what lay ahead was still heavy, and the path to saving his crew and her people remained uncertain. For now, though, they had bought time. And sometimes, in a world as unforgiving as Athra, time was the greatest victory of all. The singing dunes had fallen silent, their song reduced to a low hum that felt almost peaceful compared to the chaos that had threatened to consume the moments before. Jace knelt in the sand, his heart still racing from the adrenaline, the weight of the past few hours pressing down on him like a lead blanket. His hands were scraped and raw, but he clutched the vial of crystal petals as though it held the very essence of hope. Olynthia remained at his side, her hand still resting on his shoulder. The fierce warrior facade she usually wore was gone, replaced by a softer, more vulnerable expression. Her ochre markings were smudged, and her breathing was heavy, but she was very much alive, and looking at him as if she was trying to commit every detail of his face to memory. Jace, she whispered, her voice carrying a weight of gratitude and something deeper. You did it. He managed a shaky laugh, his exhaustion making it sound more like a sob. We did it, he corrected, meeting her eyes. I couldn't have done this without you. The world around them felt fragile, as if the slightest wrong move could shatter the fragile peace they'd fought so hard to restore. Jace's mind was still processing the fact that they had somehow managed to close the rift and stabilize the planet's energy, but there was no time to celebrate. The crystal petals he had collected were only the beginning. He still had to create the cure and administer it to his crew and Olynthia's tribe. He pushed himself to his feet, swaying slightly as the ground settled beneath him. Olynthia steadied him, her touch firm but gentle. We must return to your metal bird, she said, gesturing in the direction of the swamp. Your people will need this cure as much as mine. Jace nodded, though the thought of trekking back through the swamp with his body so battered made his stomach clench. He knew there was no other option, though. Every second counted. He turned to Velos, who had been standing in silent contemplation. His spear still gripped tightly in his hands. Velos's dark eyes met Jace's, and for a moment, the tension between them hung heavy in the air. The warrior's face was a mask of conflicting emotions, anger, guilt, and a begrudging respect that he clearly didn't want to feel. He took a step forward, his jaw set. You saved us, Velos said, each word dragged from his mouth as if it physically hurt to admit. I misjudged you, outsider. Jace was too exhausted to feel triumph in the moment but he offered a small, weary nod. We all want the same thing, he replied, his voice rough. To survive. Velos's gaze flicked to Olynthia, and the vulnerability there was so raw that Jace almost felt like an intruder witnessing it. Whatever had existed between the two of them, love, betrayal, or some complex mixture of both, was far from resolved. But Velos's shoulders sagged, the fight draining out of him. I will not stand in your way, he said, and with that, he turned and strode off into the dunes, his spear clutched tightly in one hand. Olynthia watched him go, a shadow of sadness crossing her face, but she didn't waver. Instead, she looked at Jace, her expression a mask of determination. Come, she said, her voice steady. The swamp will be treacherous in the dark, and we have no time to waste. The journey back to the Astrid Dawn was grueling. The swamp seemed more hostile than ever, as if angered by their earlier intrusion. Jace stumbled over gnarled roots and sank into the thick mud more times than he could count, his legs burning from the effort of pulling himself free. Olynthia led the way, her spear ready, her sharp eyes scanning the darkness for any threats. When they finally reached the crash site, Jace's heart clenched. The Astrid Dawn looked even worse than he remembered, its hull was battered and scorched, the emergency lights flickering weakly. But the sight of his crew, battered but alive, gave him a renewed sense of purpose. Captain Mira was the first to approach, her usually stoic face creased with worry. She took in Jace's haggard appearance and the alien warrior standing beside him, her hand instinctively going to her sidearm. Jace, she said, her voice taut. What in the hell? Jace cut her off, holding up the vial of crystal petals. I have the cure, he said, his voice stronger than he felt. These petals can neutralize the toxins but we need to work fast. Myra's eyes widened, and for a moment, she looked like she might question him. But then her gaze flicked to the crew members slumped against the walls of the ship, their faces pale and lined with pain, 
and she nodded. Get to work. The makeshift lab Jace set up in the remains of the medical bay was cramped and sweltering. Olynthia watched with quiet intensity as he ground the crystal petals into a fine powder, mixing them with a stabilizing agent and some of the herbal extracts she had provided. His hands were steady despite his exhaustion, his mind running on pure adrenaline and the desperate need to succeed. Virus, his AI, had been reactivated and provided data analysis, though its usual sarcasm was thankfully subdued. Doctor, virus intoned, the compound's molecular structure appears to be stabilizing. Your hypothesis may yet hold. Jace let out a shaky breath, relief flooding through him. He carefully drew the newly synthesized cure into a series of syringes, each one containing the antidote he had risked everything to create. He turned to Mira and the other crew members who had gathered, their faces a mixture of hope and fear. This should work, he said, his voice raw. It has to. Mira held out her arm without hesitation, her jaw set in that familiar, unbreakable line. Jace injected the first dose, his heart thudding in his chest. The seconds felt like hours, but slowly, color returned to Myra's face, and she let out a shuddering breath. It's working, she whispered, her eyes wide with awe. Jace's knees nearly buckled, but he forced himself to stay upright, moving from crew member to crew member, administering the cure. When he had finished, he sank onto a nearby crate, his whole body trembling with exhaustion and relief. Olynthia stood beside him, silent but strong, her presence a comforting anchor. The crew began to recover, their strength returning in small, hopeful increments. Laughter broke out, hesitant at first but growing stronger, as though they couldn't quite believe they were going to make it. Mira approached Jace, her expression softer than he'd ever seen it. You did good, Doc, she said clapping him on the shoulder. Damn good. Jace managed a tired smile, but his relief was tempered by the knowledge that his work wasn't done. He turned to Olynthia, who had been watching the scene with quiet reverence. Your people, he said, we have to hurry. They need this cure, too. Olynthia's eyes shone with gratitude, and she knelt beside him, her voice soft but resolute. You have done more for us than any outsider ever has. We will not forget this. He met her gaze, feeling the weight of her words, the connection that had grown between them in such a short but harrowing time. It was more than just mutual respect. It was something deeper, something fragile yet unbreakable. Jace, she said, and his name on her lips sounded like a promise. We will save them. Together. With the remaining doses of the cure, Jace and Olynthia returned to the tribe, moving quickly through the now familiar paths of the swamp. The tribe greeted them with wary, hopeful eyes, and Great Mother the Laura herself stepped forward, her hands trembling with both anticipation and fear. Olynthia spoke softly, her voice strong. The healer has returned, and he brings salvation. Jace administered the cure to the elders first, watching with bated breath as the color slowly returned to their weathered faces. The tribe held its collective breath, and then, as the first elder opened her eyes and whispered a word of thanks, a wave of relief and joy swept through them. The tribe celebrated quietly, their songs of gratitude lifting into the swamp air, mingling with the gentle hum of the crystals. Jace felt something warm and indescribable bloom in his chest, a sense of purpose, of belonging, that he hadn't felt in a long time. Olynthia stood beside him, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. You have done what I feared was impossible, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Jace turned to her, feeling the weight of everything they had been through together. We did it, he said, echoing his earlier words, but this time they felt heavier, more meaningful. He reached out, hesitated for a fraction of a second, and then let his fingers brush hers. The contact sent a spark of something electric through both of them. Their eyes met, and for a moment, the world around them seemed to fade away. There was no grand unrealistic declaration of love, no mystical bond to tie them together just two people who had fought, suffered, and saved each other, and who were now standing on the brink of a new beginning. Olynthia's lips curved into a small, genuine smile. The future is uncertain, she said, her voice steady. But it is a future we will shape. Together. Jace's heart felt full, impossibly so. He squeezed her hand gently, a silent promise of what was to come. Yeah, he murmured, his voice thick with emotion together. The swamp around them pulsed with life, 
the crystals glowing softly as if in acknowledgement. Athra had been unforgiving and full of danger, but it had also given them hope, a shared mission, and perhaps, if they were lucky, something even more precious. The battle for survival wasn't over, but they were ready to face it. Hand in hand, Jace and Olynthia stood amidst the glowing world of Athra, looking toward the horizon and the promise of a tomorrow they had fought so hard to see.